Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. And we are live. Today is um, the final class I'm teaching on our topic of apologetics. And we are going to play a video to start the class. And uh, for the people watching online, I hope the audio goes through. If it doesn't, uh, enjoy the video clips. It'll be two minutes, and then I'm going to start my presentation. So this uh, preview is uh, some footage that I filmed with James Norrid for his Story of Redemption films. And this is a little trailer for the locations that we got to travel to. So <clears throat> I highly recommend you guys go to storyofredemptionfilms.com and watch the, um, the Bible study series that James and I got to film. He, he did such a wonderful job uh, preaching uh, an overview of the whole Bible. The story of redemption is um, translated into 40 different languages. So it's a great resource to use with uh, other people who don't even speak your own language. And I uh, want to make sure this PowerPoint is pulled up. Let's see. Let me try that again before we get going. want to make sure everyone online could see the PowerPoint. So once again, this is the last class of this series for the Evidence for Christianity. Uh, last week, we talked about um, locations and archaeology connected to the Old Testament. And in the past, I've given one presentation, but there was just so much information. I had to think of a title, how to break it into two sections. So I, I decided I'll focus on locations and archaeology that match the Old Testament last week. And this week, we're going to talk about uh, locations and archaeology connected to the New Testament and the lack of Jesus and the early Christians. And this topic uh, that we've been talking about is the topic of apologetics. It's based off 1 Peter 3.15, to always be ready to make a defense and apologia, apologia to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. 
Now, if you just can't get enough of this topic, Alyssa and I start a small group on Wednesday nights that we talk about the big questions and the evidence for Christianity. So if you have an interest in this, join our small group. You could come in person, or if you love this digital um, uh, tool, we have a Zoom, uh, take a screenshot of this number and, and join us. And we meet on every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We even have people join us from other states, you know, different time zones. And so, uh, so we encourage you to come join us. A good question to ask people to start a spiritual conversation, and there's many, but one good question to ask is, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Another question you can ask is, uh, is a favorite one I like, and Ray Comfort, he uses this question, is, do you believe in an afterlife? And just let the person talk, and that could start a good spiritual conversation. Now, uh, I've been to Israel three times, and uh, the first time I went, and went with my friend James Nord, and, and in that picture you see James, and you see our tour guide, Tim Brimley, and our friend Scott. And, uh, and you know, when you're videotaping, you're kind of focused on the project, and yes, we see all the his history and historical locations, but it didn't hit me, it hit me until I saw the Sea of Galilee. And I had this spiritual awakening just thinking, you know, this is where Jesus would have walked all around these mountains and cities and even, yes, on the Sea of Galilee. And uh, I just kind of had a, a moment of waking up. All these stories I grew up learning about and studying, that was actually there. You got to see these places for myself. So I highly encourage you. If you can make a trip to the Holy Lands, I highly recommend it. Um, I felt safe, and boy, in Israel, they have it down to a science to, to take people to the different locations. A lot of these um, uh, archaeology sites that they have found, they made into uh, historical parks that you have to pay an entrance fee, and usually people go with a church group on a tour bus, and they take you to... to the spot to spot and you know they try to show you as much as you can and usually it's about 10 days and it's one of the best experiences i've ever had so i highly recommend um if you can try to uh, go on a trip to israel to see the holy lands you want to make sure that powerpoint is up there <clears throat> looks like it is and uh let's see the screen changed a little bit well, let's see if it, it moves here. Having some technical issues. Let me pull it back up here. There we go. Okay. So here's a map of uh, the main uh, locations to see. And I don't know if you guys could read the names, but I'll point out just a couple of big areas. Uh, well, let's recognize the two bodies of water in the north. That's the Sea of Galilee. And we're going to talk about a few of the cities you could actually see today. You could see uh, Chorazin, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Magdalene, the Mount of Arbel. And then you could uh, follow the river below the Sea of Galilee. You could follow the Jordan River all the way to Jericho and the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is incredible to float in the Dead Sea. You can't even, you can't even sink. And uh, then next to the Dead Sea, around that area is Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, the caves of Qumran. That's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And then uh, we mentioned Jericho. And when you read scripture, it says when Jesus left Jericho and went up the mountain, you literally go up the mountain until you reach Jerusalem. And then if you go south from Jerusalem, you're going to go to Hebron. That's where Abraham is buried. And Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. And, and north of that is Bethany, where Jesus rose Lazarus from the tomb. And, uh, you know, as a kid, when I saw the maps in the back of the Bible, I, I just didn't think too much about it. But when you go to the Holy Lands, it makes it so exciting because then those maps come to life. And the names of these cities are real places in history. Well, let's start in Bethlehem. Uh, this is the city that, um, well, David lived here. And uh, then Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And uh, we got some footage of, uh, you could just tell, like, 
you can really imagine, and, and we actually saw to this day shepherds uh, raising their sheep. In fact, James and I got some footage uh, of a shepherd raising sheep, and we asked if it was okay if James could hold a sheep in his arms. And, and, uh, and we had that opportunity because um, our car broke down. So we had a little extra time to get some stock footage so our driver could fix the flat tire. So we, um, we thought, well, let's not waste this time of waiting for the car to get fixed. So we got some footage of, uh, some shepherds and sheep. Um, and, uh, you know, James and I, this, is my friend, a B helped as a cameraman and, uh, James and I laughed about the situation. Cause you know, when you make a video, time goes by so fast, you don't have time for like a flat tire and things like that. And we thought, well, you know, we could think of another couple that had uh, problems in Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph, trying to find an end. Um, some things just never change. So now um, we got to visit the Church of the Nativity. This is built over the small, the the actual uh, location of uh, of Bethlehem, the little village of Bethlehem. And how they actually know that this is the lo location is they actually uh, go below the church. They have graves of the baby boys that King Herod killed. Now, if you look behind me, you see that man standing there and you see the little door. The door is short. And so everyone who enters the church of nativity where Jesus uh, was born, um, this church was built many years later, but you would have to bow down to even enter the church to pay respect to the Messiah. This is uh, the cave that tradition says Jesus was born, and they put a star where I don't know why they think, how they know this is where Jesus was born, but at least it's a place to show honor that this is the cave that Jesus was born um, in this area, at least this is the location of where the um, Bethlehem, the village was. Now, outside of Bethlehem, King Herod made a palace. He actually made this mountain, put the palace on top and below, uh, just like me. He likes a swimming pool. So <laughs> behind these pillars, he had this huge swimming pool. And this was a really fun location to film, film at. Now, this would have been the location the wise men would have went to King Herod's palace. And, uh, and then King Herod sent the order to kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem. And they actually found the tomb, the ossuary of King Herod. The people must have hated King Herod because his tomb was smashed. You can see this tomb in the Israel Museum. The next stop we're going to go to is Canaan. This is the, they built a church over this uh, location to honor the first miracle of Jesus turning water into wine. And then next we're going to go to Nazareth. This is the hometown where Jesus grew up as a little boy. And um, also if you go to Nazareth, they made this place that they do reenactments. It's called Nazareth Village. In fact, the next time I go to Israel, I'm going to try uh, to go during Easter because I just found out researching for this presentation that uh, I knew they had a replica of what a first century city would look like. It looks like Capernaum and they have actors, which you could see anytime you go, but they do a huge Easter play and it just looks incredible. Now, if you can't make it to Israel, they actually have something just like this in Texas. Um, uh, pretty close to Weatherford called, uh, let's see, this is Nazareth. So the one here in Texas, Capernaum Studios. And they do three plays a year, one for uh, the Christmas story and another one for the Easter play. And they even have one during Halloween. It's kind of a uh, end times uh, story. And uh, basically it's kind of like a left behind movie. Uh, this year we went and it was actually quite believable. I couldn't quite tell what was news and what was the play. And it, it, they do such a good job. And so I recommend going to the Nazareth Village. And you can see uh, it's like going back in time. Now, this is a replica, meaning they remade what it would have looked like in the first century. They have actors. Um, it's <laughs> quite a fun place to go to. In Israel, I picked up this map. 
And Jesus spent the majority of his ministry around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, in the north of this map, you got Magdala, and you got, um, let's see, Canaan in the north. And if you go to the right side, you got Capernaum and Chorazin and Percy. And so we're going to talk about um, these different places. So here's the Sea of Galilee. Make sure you go on a boat ride. And, um, and behind the, the boat, you see the Mount Arbel uh, in the background. And they actually found a first century fishing boat. In fact, they, the archaeologists named this boat the Jesus Boat. It's in a little museum next to the Sea of Galilee. This would have been about the size of the boat that Jesus and his disciples would have been in when they went fishing. This small little boat. Remember the stories of uh, the storm and the Sea of Galilee? Uh, one of our, uh, there was a person we hired to take us on a smaller boat to do filming. And we interviewed him about uh, the storms in the Sea of Galilee and how high the waters could get. And, uh, and he told us it could be very dangerous out there. And, uh, you know, anywhere you go in these churches, they have these beautiful uh, paintings and artwork of Jesus throughout all these churches throughout the Holy Lands. In fact, uh, if you make a presentation like mine from your uh, traveling to the Holy Lands, you would just have tons of beautiful artwork to take a picture of, to use for a PowerPoint. And uh, now this is my favorite location in Galilee. This is on the tallest mountain in Galilee, Mount Arbel. And if you like hiking, this is just an incredible hike. And our tour guide said, this is probably the location where Jesus gave the Great Commission. Now, I also know of another group that uh, if you like hiking, you can actually hike the trail. Jesus would have hiked through Galilee to Jericho. Uh, I'm assuming they might even go all the way to Jerusalem. But uh, you can actually hike the same trail Jesus went. We didn't have enough time or vacation time to do that, but I, I think that would be so much fun. And uh, once again, this is where Jesus gave the Great Commission. There's another angle of that mountain. And, you know, before I went to the Holy Lands, I just assumed the Holy Lands was just desert. And that's, that's the pictures I saw. And I was just surprised how beautiful it was when I went to Israel. Now, in the north, it's very green. And lush. In fact, in Galilee, you could grow almost any fruit tree around the Sea of Galilee. And if you go, try to go around March. That's the most beautiful time when the grass and trees are just so green. In fact, I went to Pepperdine University, which is in Malibu, California, and it's so beautiful with the sea and the palm trees. When I went to um, uh, the Sea of Galilee, um, it reminded me of Pepperdine. It was just so beautiful. Now, you know, if we go during the summertime, it'll be dry, and in the south, it is desert. I'll show some pictures of that. Uh, this church is built over the place where Jesus gave the Beatitudes. And uh, I filmed James giving the sermon about the Beatitudes. And just look how beautiful uh, Galilee is. Now, I noticed all these yellow mustard seeds. You guys remember? Uh, when scripture says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. This is incredible to see scripture come to life to the smallest detail. There's a close up of the mustard seed flowers. And below Mount Arbel is this fishing city called Magdala. This is the birthplace of Mary Magdalene. And they actually found the oldest synagogue found in Galilee. Uh, dated to the first century. That means Jesus, he would have preached in the synagogue. He could go inside the synagogue where Jesus would have preached. They actually found a replica made in stone of the Ark of the Covenant. See that little stone in the bottom picture there? If you cross, no, if you could walk in water, if you cross or take a boat, if you cross the Sea of Galilee to the opposite side, uh, you go to this location called Kersey, and the, since the biblical times, the water has gone down um, lower. But this is the location where Jesus would have cast out the demon from that crazy man living in the cave and uh, cast out 2,000, uh, or no, cast out demons into 2,000 pigs that ran in, into the sea and drowned. Uh, 
on this mountainside, you can actually see caves, which talks about this demon-possessed man living in the caves. Now, remember this verse in the Bible? Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Well, this is the city that would have happened at. And... Uh, uh, and also but the ruins of Bethsaida. Now, uh, Bethsaida was the hometown of Philip, Andrew, and Peter, the th uh, three of the disciples. In fact, it makes sense when Jesus fed the 5,000, he, and he, uh, before he did that, he asked Philip, uh, well, uh, can you recommend a place to buy food from? Well, why did he ask Philip? Why not ask Peter? You know, why not ask one, one of the more popular apostles we read about? Well, if you read another place in scripture, it gives a clue. It, and, um, and it says that if you put the two pieces of scripture together, you find out, well, that was the hometown of Philip. He would have known where to go to uh, buy bread or food. But this is the place where Jesus fed 5,000 people. Jesus would have walked in the water to rescue the disciples from a storm. And Jesus healed a blind man with a two-part healing. Now let's go to Capernaum. Capernaum, you could see a synagogue that was actually built on top of a first century synagogue and um, it's in good shape that you can walk in this is actually uh, where peter had a house uh you know if you're a fisherman you probably want a house next to the sea and this is where uh, jesus would have healed peter's mother-in-law now that spaceship looking thing that's actually just a modern church built over the house of peter that you could walk into and look down and this is uh, where they believe uh, Peter lived, was in this house. Now, Peter gave up everything to follow Jesus. Uh, you know, I bet Peter had a dream of owning, owning his own fishing restaurant, you know, just my theory. And probably had big ideas of, you know, having a good business, maybe, a good possibility. I don't want to add a scripture, just, you know, he probably would have thought of that, I'm sure. Um, or at least he could probably make some pretty good fish. Well, um, remember when Jesus called the disciples and called Peter, and Peter said, away from me, I'm a sinful man. Can you imagine if Peter never would have followed Jesus? Everything he would have missed out on. But, you know, Jesus uh, followed Jesus. And you think about all the adventures he had living with God, the Son of God, and, uh, you know, isn't it ironic that there is a restaurant in the hometown of Peter and they named their top dish St. Peter's Fish? So you could order a St. Peter's Fish in Capernaum. Now, you can actually get baptized uh, in the Jordan River. A lot of uh, Christians, this is something uh, that's very special, get baptized in the Jordan River. Now, in Galilee, this is the pretty part of the river, but Jesus... Um, uh, probably got baptized in the section of the Jordan River closer to Jericho. In fact, uh, I asked uh, James if he could baptize me in the Holy Lands, and uh, I was a little afraid with our filming schedule. We wouldn't, may, we might not have time to make it to the Jordan River, so we're filming at the Sea of Galilee, and, and we thought, Let, let's get baptized here, uh, just in case we run out of time with the filming schedule. And I thought, you know, this is good enough. Jesus was here. He walked in this water. This water, I think, is fine. And, uh, you know, I remember the story of the dove coming down uh, when Jesus got baptized. And uh, in my case, it was, it was a drone that came down to get some get some drone footage. So, um, so it was a very special uh, moment to get baptized in the Holy Lands. And um, now... Remember the, the story of the Good Samaritan? Well, you could actually walk the road uh, that that might have happened at. I know that's a parable, but this is a road that was mentioned in that parable. Uh, now, don't worry. I, I made a note to mention this. Um, when you go on a church tour group, they're not going to take you to this location. They're going to take you in the nice highway that's over to the side. But we went off road. Um, to find kind of a wilderness to film at and this little dirt road you see james walking at you could actually uh drive your personal car down this road to jericho and then back up towards jerusalem and we kind of had this thought that you know 
this is a tiny little road. If somebody would have blocked the road and wanted to rob us or something, that Good Samaritan story came to life, you know, and luckily nothing happened to us, but it, it, we, we can't imagine like, yeah, we could really see this parable actually happening. Now, once again, uh, nothing bad happened and uh, this isn't the road the tour buses go on. They take it the nice road, the main road. This is off the beaten path. And uh, in Jericho, there's a, a monastery built on this cliff is a dramatic looking place and you can walk up it uh and this is actually past you know the ancient city of jericho that um, we talked about last week but you could walk up to this monastery and this is uh the focus of this monastery is to help people remember the temptation that jesus went through when the devil was tempting him now what's interesting is all the artwork in this uh, monastery had one theme and it was all these paintings of the devil tempting Jesus and uh, just very interesting quite the adventure to get up there would be definitely be a good movie set and there's James walking up the steps and uh, got a good location by the edge of the cliff to do the teaching at now the next location we're going to talk about the Mount of the Transfiguration. There's actually two locations. They don't know for sure, but they uh, they say it's one or the other. It could be Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon could be the location of the tr Transfiguration. Now we're going to go to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is uh, a place that Jesus took his disciples in um and people would worship all these idols of false gods. In that cave, they called, uh, called it the Gates of Hades. It was a place where uh, the pan god, the people thought, lived there. Can you imagine the real God coming in your presence, and he sees all these people bowing down and worshiping fake false idols? And Jesus asked his disciples, well, who do you say that I am? In fact, let's read the scripture. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and some others Jeremiah and one of their prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, we have finally reached Jerusalem. Now, uh, this is the uh, second t temple uh, that uh, Herod made, and you see all the tombs at the bottom. The, the remember the phrase "whitewashed tombs," and this is very expensive real estate um, uh, that the Jewish people bought tombs close to the Temple Mount. And you go down to the Kinron Ken, Valley and up to the the Temple, and you see the Dome of the Rock. That's where Abraham, they believe, uh, tried to sacrifice Isaac. A foreshadowing of um, God sent his one and only son to sacrifice his life for us. In fact, Jesus was crucified on this mountain range of Mount Moriah. Now, here's the Wailing Wall, the foundation of uh, the, the Temple Mount. And Jewish people go there to pray and write prayers and pieces of paper. You have to wear a yarmulke when you enter this uh, holy location. If you go to the Jerusalem Museum, you can actually see a replica model of what the temple would have looked like. In fact, there's a society in Israel that they're actually um, making things for the third temple right now. They're just waiting for a peace deal. And we know when that peace deal is made, uh, they're going to be ready to make that third temple. They have this golden mon menorah that you can see out in public. And I kind of wonder, well, wouldn't someone steal this golden uh, menorah? But they said, well, good luck. It, I forgot how much it weighs, which is it's too heavy to even lift. And they do have it through uh, glass around it, a uh, thick glass. But they're making uh, things for the third temple. 
Um, and so they need some type of a peace deal to happen to either build it next to the Dome of the Rock or replace the Dome of the Rock. Another place you could go to is this place where Jesus healed the blind man at the Pool of Shalom. And then in the background, if you see that door, that is Hezekiah's tunnel. And uh, this uh, is found, this miracle is found in John chapter 9. And Jesus healed a paralyzed man at the Pool of Bethesda with the five colonnades. And then you could go to Bethany and go to the tomb where Jesus ra raised his good friend who died. He raised Lazarus f from the dead, and, and, uh, and he was alive again. You could go to his tomb. And then we could go to the church built where the disciples had the Last Supper. Can you imagine being there with Jesus? In fact, if you go to uh, these plays we talked about at Capernaum uh, Studios here in Texas, you could see a reenactment of actors doing the Last Supper, and it kind of helps you think what it would have felt like to be with, with Jesus. And the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, can you imagine Jesus praying here and seeing Judas bring the soldiers down the hill and up the hill towards you? These olive trees could actually uh, grow up to 2,000 years old, and uh, but uh, these trees weren't around during the um, time of Jesus because when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, they actually cut every tree down. Um, but these trees can grow to be very, very old. Now, in Caesarea Maritime, this is another uh, palace that King Herod built along the this, this sea. Pontius Pilate spent some time here. In fact, Pontius Pilate was the person who condemned Jesus to death. Uh, and uh, you found uh, this, the archaeologists found this stone with the inscription of the name Pontius Pilate. This is uh, located in the Israel Museum. And after uh, Jesus was arrested, he would have been brought up these steps to um, uh, Caiaphas, to Caiaphas' house. Can you imagine that Caiaphas, he thought he could probably um, stop the name of Jesus? And it's ironic that years later, they build a church over the very spot where Caiaphas condemned Jesus. And they know it's Caiaphas' house because only a high priest could have his own dungeon. And so they would have lured Jesus into this pit, into this dungeon. They found the bone box ossuary of Caiaphas, the high priest. The bones were dated to a man in his 50s. And they found evidence of crucifixion. Now, this was from a uh, person named Yahu Hanan. And he had a nail through his ankle bone, showing that crucifixion was a real thing. Now, there's two possible locations of where Jesus could have been crucified or buried. Uh, now, uh, both locations are empty. There's no tomb, there's no bones, there's no body. Um, now, this location is at the garden tomb. One reason why they think this is a possible location was in the past, it looked like there was a skull on this mountain, and now it's a uh, place where buses park. Um, and uh, on the opposite side of this fence, you could see what a, uh, uh, a tomb would look like. And it's a very beautiful place. But um, the debate is uh, that some people, how they date this, it wouldn't be to the right time period of Jesus. Uh, there's kind of pros and cons of both these locations. But uh, a lot of historians favor this location as the possible site where Jesus was uh, crucified and uh, buried. This is at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And now both locations are actually in the right distance because Jesus would have been crucified outside the city gates of the original Jerusalem. And when you go to this location, uh, they built this uh, church over where Jesus, over the tomb where Jesus would have been buried at. In fact, I've been three times, and I'm always on a time crunch, and I never have enough time to wait in this line that would probably take hours to wait and to be able to go inside and see uh, inside this tomb. Now, how why they think this is the location is, uh, you know, you see the tomb and the crucifix uh, location outside the city walls. Well, 
the Romans thought they could wipe out the story of Christianity by building a pagan temple over that location. But they didn't think about by doing that, they marked the same exact location, uh, or they marked the exact location, I meant to say, of where this event happened at. And Constantine legalized all religions, and his mom um, built churches at the holy locations, including the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And inside, uh, they actually, National Geographic um, um, did a story about the, the place where the body of Christ would have laid. There was a piece of stone on top of that to kind of protect it. They opened it for the first time. And so this was in the news just a few years ago. And we talked about the shroud in a couple lessons ago. Uh, you know, the sh actual shroud is in Italy, but they actually have a museum in Jerusalem that has all the charts and facts about, you know, reasons why they think the shroud is authentic. And, uh, and so what's interesting is in this museum, they actually have, uh, they made a casting um, of what the body would have looked like. Uh, the shroud has this negative image and all the scientists have confirmed with all the technology we have today, they have no idea how to replica the shroud. The controversy is the, um, the first time the shroud was dated, they dated the wrong piece of the shroud. The, uh, it was repaired because it survived a fire. So in the middle ages, they repaired the corner of the, uh, while well, they repaired the cloth that went through some fires. And when they dated the first time, they dated a newer piece of cloth that was woven in, and that came out to the wrong date. But they dated the shroud uh, uh, a second time. They dated the authentic piece of the shroud, and it was dated around the time period of where Jesus would have lived. Uh, lived. Found pollen in the shroud that showed that that the shroud was in Jerusalem. They found indentions where the eye would have been, which. They could tell that a uh, coin expert said it was a coin dated to the first century of Pontius Pilate. What's interesting is this shroud has given kind of a, it has a 3D image in it that they can make a cast of what this crucified body would have looked like. And it matches what a crucified uh, victim of what Jesus, of Jesus. I mean, the legs were not broken. There was a spare wound. There was the crown of thorns over the whole scalp. And um, also you got the nail wounds in the wrist and in the feet. And I just thought that was so interesting. And, um, and that's definitely a topic uh, I encourage you to, to study. Dr. Gary Habermas, who's the top scholar of the case for the resurrection, he, he actually thinks that the shroud is authentic. So he would be a good, credible resource to uh, study up more on the shroud. But the body is missing and the resurrection happened. And uh, the Nazareth inscription was a inscription of a Roman law found in Nazareth saying that if anybody stole a dead body, they would uh, face the death penalty. Now back to the Holy Lands, the, on the, um, the Chapel of the Ascension, this is built on the, near the Mount of Olives. This is where Jesus would have ascended into heaven. And remember that Jesus is going to come back the same way as he left. In fact, he's going to walk through the Golden Gates. And this is, um, the Muslims actually built tombs and sealed the gate thinking that might stop Jesus. And I don't think that's going to work, but, um, but that's the Golden Gate. And in that valley, the Kindred Valley, uh, since the 4th century, I, in identification of the Kindred with the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and his name means Yahweh shall judge. Mentioned in the book of Joel has led to the belief that this will be the place of final judgment. Uh, a little side note, uh, to the picture to the right is the monument built uh, to Absalom, the son of King David. In tradition, fathers take their sons and they remind them the story of Absalom and, and tell them, don't be a rebellious son. And they throw stones at this monument. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, there's a monastery made for Judas. I thought that was interesting. And uh, Judas died um, in the other valley, the, uh, and it's called the Field of Blood. And, you know, if this is the location, uh, he probably, 
he might have been facing the city of Jerusalem where he would have hung himself. Now, this valley has a lot of history to it. Uh, in the Old Testament time period, um, there was a lot of evil that happened in this valley. In fact, uh, the Israelites would have sacrificed their children to an idol Moloch. And uh, during another part of history, this was a trash dump. They would have burnt fire um, um, for long periods of time. And so Jesus uh, called this the Hinnom Valley, I'm not pronouncing it quite correctly, but can compared this place as an example of, of hell. A lot of history to this uh, location, and thought that was very interesting. So we're going to now go back to the southern steps, and this is uh, a place we know for sure that Jesus would have walked on, and this is on the day of Pentecost that Peter would have given his uh, famous sermon, and there's 500 people that would have heard the sermon at this location, and let's read it. When the people heard this, Jesus, uh, I meant uh, Peter preaching, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all, for all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call." With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accept his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. You know, there were actually plenty of places for the Jewish people uh, because the, uh, to get baptized because they would have washed themselves before entering the temple. So it's actually possible that many people could have been baptized at this location. Now, Peter also stayed in Joppa. Uh, this is also connected to Jonah. and he's, uh, But Peter, he stayed uh, for some time with a tanner named Simon in Acts 9. Well, they have, uh, they believe this is the location for that, that story. This is the location that Peter would have had the vision of um, taking the gospel to the Gentiles by having the vision of the animals come down in the sheet. And uh, God said that it was fine to eat those animals. And uh, now we're also going to talk about how the gospel went to all the world. And we remember the story of Philip, how he uh, was able to preach the gospel to the Ethiopian Munich. Now, in uh, Ethiopia, uh, people would have traveled to worship God in Jerusalem. And, uh, and in Ethiopia, it's a very Christian nation. James and I got to go film these churches they carved in stone in the shape of a cross and um uh king lalabala said he had a dream where god told him to build jerusalem um, or a city like jerusalem in africa in ethiopia and so that's what he did and so he carved these had people carve these churches that were in the shapes of a cross so it's amazing seeing Christianity spread to the whole world. And it's amazing going inside these churches. Uh, the Ethiopians, they dressed up uh, in a way that looked, remind you of the Jewish kind of traditions. And they had these paintings of Jesus inside these churches. And it was self, definitely a very holy uh, place. Now, Saul was on a mission to kill Christians, to stop Christianity. Um, but he had the... Uh, an experience of seeing Jesus on the road of Damascus. You know, this is an actual road uh, that you could actually travel on today um, in the city of Damascus. I don't recommend it during this time. Uh, this is a dangerous place, but this is a real place uh, Saul would have traveled. And he became a Christian and um, became the greatest missionary in the world. I got to go on a trip to see the footsteps of Paul, the places he would have went. And he went to so many places, we couldn't even see them all. Uh, but we went to Corinth. Paul would have, would have uh, uh, read in First and Second Corinthians here. And um, in Corinth is also the place where Paul met Aquila and Priscilla, uh, fellow tent makers who became ministry co-workers. And uh, the... In Corinth, there's this inscription that you would read in Romans 16, 24. Uh, if you read that verse, 
It says, Erastus, who is the city director of public works and her brother, Quarantus, sends you their greetings. Well, Erastus, his name is inscribed in this stone in Corinth. And you can see the Bema seat of, uh, in Corinth. Um, Ga uh, Gallio, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, he proceeded over the trial of Paul in Corinth in Acts 18. And this is when uh, the people were angry at Paul and brought him and, and brought him to Gallio to, to judge him on the Bema seat. And um, also we went to Rhodes. Paul would have traveled here. And Athens, Greece. So this is Mars Hill in chapter Acts 17 that Paul famously stands on Mars Hill to speak to the Greek crowd about Jesus. Let's read that. Paul would have been at this location and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For, I, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God? So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhib inhibit the whole earth, and he marked out the appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. Can you imagine Paul uh, giving this famous sermon? It's so amazing to stand at this location where Paul would have given um, this sermon to people. And Paul would have traveled to the island of Crete. And remember the, the famous shipwreck. Uh, Paul was on a Roman ship and it, and it, uh, well, it sunk and they had to swim to shore, the island of Malta. We got to travel to Malta, a very beautiful city, and I got to walk on the island. And uh, I just remembered, you know, hey, I remember my Bible, and Paul got bitten by a snake. So I kept my, my eyes wide open to make sure I didn't get, you know, any snake attacks there. Now, uh, Bob Cornuke, he's an archaeologist, and he actually uh, did some research and he believes that um, they found the anchor stone of that Roman ship. So sometimes on these tours, you get a little free time, this shop. Never shop. Go to the museum. So I got a taxi and went to this little museum that they say they found the Roman anchor stone um, of Paul's shipwreck. Now, I also got to go to Rome. This is the Colosseum. And I found this incredible place to take a picture to show all of Rome. And uh, at the bottom right corner, you could go to the maritime prison. This would have been the prison um, that they would have put Paul and Peter in. This is the place they would have uh, been held in, in prison. Now, this is the location where Paul was buried. Um, now, the statue, Paul was holding a sword, and people would say, well, why would Paul have a sword? Well, the statue, the sword represents the, the, uh, the word of God, sharper than any double-edged sword. And, uh, and Paul is actually buried uh, at this location. And Peter was martyred uh, at this location where, where the pillar is at the Vatican. And uh, Peter didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same way as Jesus, and he was crucified upside down. And this is the tomb of Peter. In fact, all the disciples were willing to give their lives um, for what they knew was true. Nobody would die for a lie that they know, but they only, people die for, uh, people would die for the truth, but they would never die for a lie. And all the disciples uh, died for their faith. And, um, and Paul and John, I meant, was exiled to the island of Patmos. All the disciples died for th their faith executed martyr except for John, who was exiled on the cave of the island of Patmos. Now, uh, uh, John actually was able to leave the island of Patmos, and he's actually buried in uh, Ephesus. 
but this is the this is the time period where John uh, spent on the island Patmos, where he would have uh, had a vision and seen Jesus, and he wrote the book of Revelation. And the theme of Revelation is saying the King has come, and He is coming again. Jesus is coming again. And I got to go on a, a tour group with uh, Robert Jeffress with First Baptist Dallas and got to uh, go with his church and um, experience the Holy Lands. When it's going to happen three times. When Robert Jeffress at least two or three times, Greece and Israel. Uh, and so I got a picture with them at Megiddo. This is where the Bible talks about where the last battle uh, before Jesus comes back is going to happen. In fact, this is a very historical place. There's been many battles throughout history. In fact, the Pharaoh, Tutmosis III, uh, uh, had a big battle here. And so there's been many battles throughout history at this location. The scripture says this is where uh, the end of the world is going to have their last battle before Jesus comes back. In fact, King Solomon even has some uh, buildings and structures, uh, stables built in this location too. So we need to be ready uh, when Jesus comes. And I uh, actually sketched this artwork on my um, iPad. And one of my coworkers said that, well, Clint, you know, you've been to like all the Bible lanes, you've been to all the different locations. I mean, there's nowhere else for you to go except for heaven. And so, and so I'm looking forward to, uh, because of placing my trust in Jesus, that I don't have to be afraid of death, that I have hope that after this life, that I could be in heaven with, with God. In fact, uh, the gospel is that our sin separates us from God and there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation, that God loved us so much. He sent his one and only son to pay the price of our sin, which is a sacrifice in his life on the cross to atone for our sins. And Jesus died on the cross, paid for our sins, and um, he was buried in a tomb, and he proved he was divine because he rose from, from the grave. If you place your trust in Jesus, um, you will be saved. And we want to repent of our sins and turn away from our sins. And we want to show a sign, a covenant of the salvation that we have. We want to be obedient and be baptized, and that represents the inward decision we have made to show the world that we are a Christian. And God promises that we don't have to be afraid in this life that he will help us, he will answer our prayers. And these are real places, but the Bible is basic instructions how to get to heaven. We want to read the Bible because we want to learn about God. And we want to uh, place our trust in Jesus. I want you to watch online and place your trust in Jesus so you don't have to be afraid of death, that you can have eternal life and live with God. Can you imagine being in heaven and talking with people like Peter, talking with Daniel, talking with David? And, um, and you could ask them, um, tell me the story, Moses. I bet Moses would probably have a pretty nice place in heaven. And say, tell me the story of you leading the Israelites out of heaven or get, receiving the Ten Commandments. And David, how did, you, um, how did you defend your faith in God when Goliath was cursing him? How did you defend your faith? And then there's going to be a time where they're going to ask you, what did you do for God in your life? What are you going to say? Well, I highly, highly encourage you to visit the Holy Lands. Um, I recommend my friend Tim Brimley. Um, he takes groups of people to the Holy Lands, and he gives a great price. And he takes you off the beaten path that you wouldn't get on the normal uh, tour to Israel. So take a screenshot, take a picture. And call Tim and have him take you to the Holy Lands. In fact, he'll pretty much take you anywhere connected to the Bible. And um, also there's uh, other bigger tour companies. I've also gone with Inspiration Tours. They took First Baptist with Robert Jeffress. And they also do uh, a great tour. And they, uh, it's a much larger organization. In fact, I think they had 10 buses when I went. And I uh, highly recommend the Story of Redemption Films. Watch the videos that James and I filmed on the Holy Lands, on location. So if you want to see video of these locations and places and James teaching uh, from the Bible about these historical events, I recommend supporting this ministry and watching these videos. 
He has subtitles in 40 different languages. And another video series that I'm just a huge fan of is Drive Through History with my friend Dave Stotts. And, uh, and he also has a great video series filmed on location. I've learned so much about the Holy Lands and the history of, of the Bible watching his videos. And then I, I've made two websites on Christian apologetics of defending the Christian faith. If you go to Apologetics Quick Guide, you can see the case for Christianity. This is a minimalistic website. So if you sat down with somebody and in an hour you gave uh, the case for Christianity, this would be a great website. So on the homepage, it answers these questions. Does God exist? Is the Bible true? Is Jesus divine in the case for the resurrection? This year, we're pro producing 13 more videos to go on this website, and it's going to be a quick guide to world religions and worldviews. That's going to talk about the major world religions and, and uh, other uh, religious groups that are different from Orthodox Christianity. And so when you understand the Christian worldview, it's going to help you be able to explain the gospel and show that there's strong evidence for Christianity being true. And so we have a quick guide and a quick chart and a PowerPoint that goes along with these videos. And if you click on resources, it's going to take you to the bigger website. And this bigger website is called Prove the Bible Beyond a Reasonable Doubt. So the domain is called, the website's called ProveTheBible.com. Steve Lee, who I filmed the original videos with, are on the homepage. But what makes this website different is it answers all the top objections that skeptics have or seekers might have. And I got to film a lot of those videos, over 100 videos, with uh, Sean McDowell, who wrote the evidence that demands a verdict. So if you click on a tab, Defenders of the Faith, you can watch top, the top apologists like J. Werner Wallace. He was a cold case detective who was an atheist, became a Christian because he uh, had the skills to tell if the eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses were telling the truth. And now he's a Christian defending the Christian faith. Sean McDowell, who was the editor of the Apologetic Study Bible, Evidence Demands a Verdict. I got to film over 100 videos with Sean McDowell answering top, the top questions that people have, hard questions, uh, maybe questions skeptics have. And then uh, some short videos with Frank Turek with Cross-Examine, Cross and he wrote a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And that's a great book on Christian apologetics. And I filmed... Um, Quick answers on creation, the topic of creation with Dr. Jason Lyle. He's an astrophysicist, and I think he's one of the best people to talk about the topic of creation and debating evolution and uh, the age of the earth. Uh, he is an expert in that topic and uh, made the top questions with him, uh, which is on that website. So I recommend his videos, too. And so the name of the website is ProveTheBible.com, and we have finished the seven part uh, class on Christian apologetics. And I appreciate you coming. And we finished just in time for no questions and we can make it to church. We got two minutes of visit and I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed this presentation and thank you for watching.